Good, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here. And this is going to be a rather different sort of presentation, I hope. There will be nothing flicking on the screen behind me. Uh, and there will be a conclusion of the speech at the beginning. Uh, the conclusion is very simple. It's a conclusion I've reached looking at this whole area over many years, and it's simply to say that there are no conclusions. There will be very few figures used here, no charts, no trends, very few statistics. For what I'm trying to look at at a personal level uh, is the issue that's obviously transfixing us all at this conference. Uh, where does all our futures lie? I'm a journalist. I write. Uh, where does that work get published? Who reads it? Who cares about it if anybody cares about it? You're in the business of distributing journalism. It's exactly the same for you. We all depend on each other. Now, what odds on survival are there for people who put words on pages and the people who ship those words around the world? Uh, I'm not being controversial when I see so many shrugs of despair over questions like this. Uh, my successor as editor-in-chief of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, a journalist who often seems to be at the heart of the digital storm, has had many things to say, many ideas to propagate as he's moved Guardian Online to well over 100 million unique browsers a month around the world. And where The Guardian, and that's in America too, of course, where The Guardian is one of the top 100 digital news sources and this year's winner of a Pulitzer Prize. Yet if you ask Alan the self-same question, where lies the future, he'll give my answer. He'll give an answer which says, nobody knows. Nobody can be quite sure. Samir brings us hope uh, and lots of enthusiasm. I, th I hope he knows. I'm not quite sure that I know. I'm just trying to work it out as I go along. Now, what we've done so far is, I think, is too little to stop and think. We've got to try and get our balance. And let's, in very simple terms, what I try to do often in journalism, look at other media, look at history, look at other forms of instructions. Long ago, Sophocles, Euripides, Shakespeare, Arthur Miller, Moliere, uh, there was theater. What happened almost 100 years ago when Hollywood came into the equation. Many critics, and you can read them, said that the theater was doomed. Who'd pay in future to see human beings in funny costumes when they could see D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation or the latest Cecil B. DeMille? Well, come to the London week at West End any week or the Edinburgh Festival a few weeks ago. That was bunk. Theater is alive and flourishing. You could do the whole thing over again with Newspaper, uh, newspaper and book reading as radio came along. Didn't work. Television, that would kill radio and the movies. No, more bunk. Uh, to the contrary, more things fitted together. The only things that didn't fit together were siren voices prophesying the extinction of this or that. So let's see where these arguments apply today to words and to print. Some of the things that uh, Samir was saying are, of course, right. But let's just start with <coughs> the heaviest form of print. Uh, to begin with, that's books, physical books, and bookshops. Three or four years ago, there was Amazon with its Kindles, there were Nooks, there were bookshops closing, e-books, you would have read it, were confidently asserted as driving the printed book into history. But that was clearly yet another example of hype over experience. Today, if you look at the figures, ebook growth has stalled and sits on something of a plateau, neither growing much nor falling back. American surveys, surveys show that ebooks have found a good market, but so have physical books in many areas, and sales are growing there too. The market has expanded with technology and not shrunken. And within that basic truth, there are obvious fluctuations. Where is the ebook strongest? It's in fiction, most obviously, mass supermarket fiction. Buy a novel, a 51st Shade of Grey, read it fast and click it away. 
Price and availability and disposability all play their part. But books come in many shapes and sizes. Their presents, something you give for birthdays and Christmas. Kindle gives you nothing to wrap up there. They are books for kids, a whopping 20% or so of the market. What fond uncle or aunt wants to give little Johnny another few hours of staring a screen in a corner? Or give little Jemima a non-book without all those beautiful bells and whistles that great children's illustrators provide? It's not what you do and it's not how we behave. The point, actually made recently by Ender's research specialists, is also enmeshed in a physical experience. People who buy books like the feel of them. They thought, therefore like bookshops, often big bookshops, skillfully arranged to absorb an interest as well as to buy. It's browsing, it's dipping, it's chatting, it's having a cup of coffee and starting again. It's seeing what catches your fancy as a leisure activity. This is something that all those Google or Amazon ads and promotions based on the last few hotels or the last nights at the opera you clicked on can't match. They extrapolate what you might like from what you bought last. They don't replicate the real book buying ritual beloved of real physical book buyers. They don't open minds by showing you and selling something unexpected. They are a convenience for the converted, not a breakthrough to a new world. Now, of course, there are other issues in the mix here. There's pricing, we'll come back to that again soon. <clears throat> Will the market here continue to provide very cheap e-books or cheaper e-books, or will prices for hot tickets climb towards print parity, as Amazon seems to be thinking at the moment? There's the onrush of the tablet market, tablets providing many other diversions besides reading a book on the same day. There's technology itself and the rise of smartphones consuming ever more screen time around the world. But do I really want to reread War and Peace in the Bath on my new mo mobile phone reader or on the train on my new supremely bendy iPhone 6? Hard questions in this sort of area are already providing answers that turn back tides of excited drivel. No, physical books aren't going away. No, book marketing and bookshops aren't going on a long, grim trek down the Amazon. Many interesting things are happening in book world, but not straightforward transition from one way of spreading the word to another. And there's a lesson here, of course. What happens in life as it unrolls is almost more complicated than we expect. You can just about take a simple product and reproduce its experience via technological change. Exit very old gramophone records, enter DVDs. Exit DVDs and enter most of, and most of their high street outlets too, and enter streaming. The point is that the sounds you hear on your desk in your living room, just like smooth movie, streamed movies from Netflix and the rest that you see on your TVs, are identical. The music is the same, the film or TV series is the same. It's a pure distribution set shift. But book publishing and buying isn't simple. And the easy catchphrases of transition, of replacement, don't resonate clearly. Which brings me to, more briefly, to area two. Uh, because Samir and we've had so much great stuff on it already today. Which is magazines. Something between a fat book and a thin newspaper. Uh, over in Britain, uh, we had uh, the latest six monthly of magazine sales audited by ABC a few weeks ago. No surprises in a sense. Another million copies gone year on year. Only 21.2 billion copies remaining for titles who follow an ABC uh, monitoring route, though of course many of them don't. So surely the transition to digital version is roaring away here. The big headlines in the trade press go to the titles like The Economist with Digital sales in Britain growing 72% to nearly 22,000 a week. Remember, though, that if you want to claim combined circulation from ABC, you need to put print and digital subscriptions together to produce a paid-for total and everything. And that's a good deal less impressive in England. Put those 21.2 million print magazines to one side of the table and ask how many digital subscriptions added to cash revenue, their cash revenue on the other side. There were just 396,000 subscriptions. This is a puny movement as yet. 
fact, it's barely any movement at all. Magazine physical sales may be going down, but factor in some of the things we noted when we looked at books and raised our eyes to the wider world. Look at those, here we are. Our old friend Price is back through a recession that lingers on in too many mature markets, including France. There's a tendency for publishers to reduce circulation and distribution areas of their products in order to cut costs at the margins. That's okay, perhaps, if we're talking economist digital subscriptions in Abu Dhabi or Antibes. Of course, online can show real gains there. But if you're producing something you're not selling as cross as much of the world as you did, like, to be honest, UK print copies for many British papers, then the dip in fortunes is, to an extent, self-inflicted. Push up the price too much, cut back on the breadth of what you offer, where you offer it. And there's, as we've seen for the last few years, decline and depression. It's not rocket science, it's self-inflicted. Just like in book publishing, there are some areas that are better dealt with in the net. Uh, think of the male magazines you used to see on a new agent shelf. Uh, think of fashion magazines which become unfashionable exactly like the clothing and the makeup they are selling from year to year. This, with or without digital, is a shifting world of tastes. Magazines of their nature are targeted. They don't attempt to include a bit of everything. So their fortunes can change with their chosen sub subject matter, which in turn means that new magazines can and are being started month by month. Professor Magazine has given you the American figures. They're deeply, deeply reassuring. They show that things here as in the book world, uh, are not as we blithely assumed only a few years ago. And there is something reassuring in Britain and sitting down on the sofa with a glossy copy of Vanity Fair that was rising in the latest ABC circulation, or the Tatler, that's another rising, or lying in Bath with the satirical fortnightly private eye, a champion that makes almost no effort on the web at all. <coughs> But let's get on to the third cracked leg of this stool. That's newspapers. Uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about magazines today. Uh, it's time, I think, to talk about papers for a moment. Now, here again, the verdict is mixed. Um, Jim Bilton this morning gave us a load of worldwide figures, and we can see <coughs> how badly things were going in Western Europe and uh, uh, not just Western Europe, America, and in some other developed parts of the world, though with Asia and the Pacific area brightening things up somewhat. Now, there's no point at all in denying that the advent of digital has made and is making a huge impact here. Newspaper sales in Britain are dipping towards half the number they stood at when I started writing about the industry nearly 15 years ago. <coughs> That's goodbye to virtually 15 million copies a day, hello to eight and maybe soon seven million. Hello on a laptop or smartphone to 100 million or soon 200 million users worldwide. And if you can persuade enough of the new digital recruits to pay for their privilege, then everything in this new world begins to settle down. Is that possible? It's a challenge. It's very excited. It's a great time to be involved, but is also in, in its enthusiasm and in its fear, leaving many more mundane factors out of the equation. It's not just in magazine, in newspapers particularly. There is a price element about this which we shouldn't duck. <coughs> of course, when you pay for a product, the UK Press Gazette, Britain's online press journal of record, did some recent looking at launch, looking at pricing recently, and it, confi it confirmed that most national, well, national newspaper circulations have been drooping. Uh, their price, in real terms, had gone up by well over 50 percent. I.e., the price has been whizzing up over the past few years, and so the circulation has declined too. 
Andy, UK Press has also pointed out that since the onset of the economic downturn in 2008, newspapers have compensated for lack of advertising by increasing cover price. At the same time, less advertising has meant fewer pages and thinner papers. In short, that's less for more. Now, in what other walk of commercial life is that a winning formula? In a world where sales are supposed to count, where does less marketing and much less innovation win the day? In the world of market coverage, your world of distribution, how does pulling out of the market, not distributing far beyond your immediate target area, improve prestige, image, or morale? In a world of change, how does advertising constantly in your own pages to print readers, urging them to stop buying this paper edition and turn to something cheaper <coughs> in, a, in a digital package? Does that make supreme sense? The revenue rate newspapers raise from digital ads varies between 5, 10, 15% of what print advertising delivers. Where's the short-term sense in giving what you have away free or for much less than people are still prepared to pay? And where's the sense in incessant speeches and editorializing which laments the impending demise, decline, doom of print papers? That's the very reverse of conventional promotion more despondent resignation. In this some new wonder, is this some new wonder formula for success? Bad mouthing your product, not developing it, not changing it, not engaging brain on what you're turning out, <clears throat> just producing wild clouds of gloom and covering your head. Those, until quite recently, a monster cloud of gloom and doom, and it was much of it self-inflicted and self-generated. <coughs> Go back to my history at the start. Did the movie moguls of Hollywood facing the threat of TV put up the price of cinema seats by double the rate of inflation and tell Oscar to commit suicide pronto? No, they reinvented the cinema experience carved up cinemas, widened screens, perfected sound, spent more and not less. They still believed they were right. Did theater impresarios lower the safety curtain on darkened stages? No, they marketed and targeted much better, invested in spectacle, in musicals, in new talent, uh, and developed a new, young, buoyant audience. So why have newspapers been so wretchedly defensive? There are all manner of different factors in play here, and you probably need to encompass all of them. One is the way that decline is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the fact that most dynamic managers of the future don't choose to work for what they see as decline international. So management innovation can slide. Another is the way that profitability is always compared to that of the year before or the year before the boom went down to bust. Noticed rather that in Anne-Marie's excellent dissertation, looking at her chart of French retail outlets mounting and then sliding down with the recession. That's something that we find over and over and again. And so often when you're looking at figures in a historical sense, history seems to start at 2005 or 2006, still going up and then going down with a mighty wallop if you spread it rather wider than that, then you see many other factors at work. Another factor in this, all of this is our old friends, the advertising agencies, who are facing an existential crisis themselves, but hanging on to what's going up for them, what's increasing, rather than what's going down or stagnant. So they have a natural interest in talking up the future, which is bright, rather than lamenting what they see as a failing past. Another is the seemingly congenital inability of competing newspapers to get together and promote themselves in an industry full of clout and possibilities. We're doing a bit better at that in Britain at the moment, but we need to keep on doing better and better. There's no point having a, a newspaper industry where all you see is newspapers taking, uh, kicking lumps out of each other. Another is a short-sighted investment 
uh, non-boom, a short-sighted refusal to invest, to cut costs from year to year, to remember that news is more than just a commodity, but one of the lifebloods of civilization. You may go on into it to make money, but you shouldn't see yourself as only there to make money. News is democracy. It has duties as power, as besides power and rewards. And you owe more than debts of gratitude and obligation to it. If you're going to be in the news business, you are in a serious business and you have wider obligations. And I could add to this litany, particularly when we get down to ownership structures for newspapers. Uh, one of the greatest sources of gloom in the American market at the moment uh, is the way that the great chains are being carved up uh, and farmed out, uh, divided, uh, loss-making newspapers, bright other factors. That's all driven by Wall Street. Fantastic. We all understand market imperatives. But we have to remember, particularly in the newspaper sector, that market imperatives aren't everything. So let me go back to the beginning. There are no certainties about decline. See what we've seen in the uh, printed book. See how we hail the tablet as salvation for magazines, and then remember what happened to Rupert Murdoch's The Daily. See the Times of London beginning to edge up in sales now, a newspaper moving forward. See the editor of the New York Times only last week say, they'll, they'll say that his paper will be in the, I quote, majesty of print for as far as he can see. See Politico in Washington, a web service and a newspaper, making money and now heading for Brussels, probably in time for next year's district press. See how the FT builds a giant paywall on the web but keeps its print uh, version turning Spends of, spending tens of thousands of pounds only last week re redesigning the print version as the flagship of its news. You can, if you innovate hard enough, if you believe rather than succumb, find many ways to survive and even to grow. The printed newspaper isn't like a DD DVD, an identical product that can be streamed into obsolescence. It's there to be read in different circumstances, offering a, an overall agenda bringing to your attention stories that you know nothing about. It isn't a narrow clicking path from one page to another. It's a broad menu featuring areas like sport where the websites are notoriously feeble. I couldn't possibly say that any of this eternally guarantees that the death of forests is over or that newspapers will be around for another four centuries. I remember the seven years since iPhone uh, was first launched. Who on earth knows what's coming down the high-tech track? Who, <clears throat> 10 years' time at this conference, will be talking about new, dev new devices, new ways of communicating? Of course they will. But I think it's totally wrong at this point as we catch our breath to carry uh, a defensive message. There's no, there's no harm in saying we don't know I don't know, I don't, I, I, <clears throat> I talk to many people who hope they know one way or another, and a lot of people who say they know. But I'm bound to say that not knowing is in one sense the biggest reassurance that one can have. It means that the future is exciting, that there's a wide opportunity to go at things, to have a bash, to say that we're in a world and in a trade where innovation and opportunity knocks. That's a message that's come through very clearly from this meeting. And I hope I shall certainly carry it away. And I hope you will too. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have, we have time for a question or two. And I'm going to steal the stage since I'm on the stage and ask you the first question. Why do you think we are not treating all these self-inflicted wounds you talked about, I mean, in, in print? I mean, why do we still ignore finding a prescription to heal us and continue on the same road? Uh, but to me, I mean, I thought you were right to say that things are beginning to turn around. I was able to write uh, a column in The Observer yesterday which said <coughs> that we've, we've been going on for as long as I can remember about inevitable transition from uh, print to digital, digital but now 
that's fading away. Even The Guardian, uh, which has been a tremendous digital leader in many respects, has come to feel, too, that the print version is much more important uh, than uh, they thought. That's why we're putting more money and more investment into print, too. It's not a question of one or the other. It's a question of both. And the, the question beyond that is, how do you find a balance out of that? I don't have the least idea how you find a balance. I was hugely reassured by your dynamic presentation full of sunshine and optimism, and that's probably true. I only differ from you in saying, I don't quite know, uh, but I hope you're right. Thank you. Questions from the audience? David? As David would say, please wait until you have the mic in your hand before you ask the question. Uh, thank you, Peter. Not, not only for coming, but sharing uh, your thoughts with us. I've got two areas of real worry. One is the youngsters. Uh, I have twins, uh, as you know, 25 years old, just under. Um, they don't go and buy a newspaper like I used to when I was 25, but they don't spend any money online either. So are we all <laughs> heading for the abyss, no matter what? clever plans about because the youngsters once they hit a paywall or something like that most of them disappear in another direction so that's one point my youngsters the second one there are now people business managers in the industry and i pointed out last year openly saying let's cut the distribution of our print product to drive everything towards digital now is that heading to the abyss in your view or can they make that work the digital first mentality uh let me, let me do the second question first. Uh, John Payton, the wizard for the Digital First Company, is on the Guardian board, so uh, I will be very genteel in anything I say on this area. However, it is a fact that that digital first, second biggest American chain, I think, uh, is up for dismemberment, up for sale now, uh, and is digital first in that sense has not been a success. Uh, that's not a, a badge of misery. It just means that if nobody knows, th that some alleys you go down are going to prove to be not quite right. And maybe the company was loaded with too much debt when it was originally f set up as opposed to now. So I, uh, nobody, nobody can quite say. But I think it's much too easy to be ayatollic about all of this. There's no secret, because I've written it, I regretted the withdrawal of uh, easily available uh, British newspapers around Europe, simply because I thought it made a statement, just the same statement that I see when I'm happy to go down to my local Sainsbury's in London and find copies of El Pais down there. Uh, physical newspapers tell you something about the area you live in and I think we all ought to be in Europe too but then that's only me the, the second uh, area you sorry what, what, what was this yeah. oh young sorry uh, there are two things to say about the youth market uh, one is I can, one, of the, one of the things of being quite old is that you know that this argument has been there since the year dot. Uh, and in, in areas like the BBC, in areas like Radio 4, which used to be the home uh, service when I was young and growing up, it was always said that young people didn't listen to Radio 4. It was too wordy, too full of seriousness. Uh, and that in 30 or 40 years' time, it would be dead. Actually, what's happened is that people change as they grow older. Uh, Radio 4 has an average age of, I think, 59 going on 60. Uh, that's, not a, that's pretty much in the Radio 2 smooth listening music area, uh, with Radio 1 doing as well as it's ever done, catering for a much younger audience. We have to, in a world where everything changes, I think we have to very much beware the thought that everything doesn't also change as you go through life. Uh, in just the same way that when Diana this morning was talk talking about Women's Weekly, 
there we are. Uh, it, it, it's an old, it sounds like an old readership, but by golly, it's been around for a long time. And if we come back in 50 years' time, I bet it'll be there again too. Well, on that positive note, thank you very much. Cheers.